100 years ago this May, more than 300 of our ancestors were murdered in a brutal act of white tyranny. It started the way many massacres of our people did at that time, with the white mob using the lies of a white woman to unleash deep-rooted racial violence against black communities. But we know all too well that such traumatic brutality never ends quietly, because there are generational prices we pay for the sins of white supremacy. I'm Jay from Push Black, and on this episode of Black History Year, we're remembering the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. Too often, the past is rewritten or erased by the violent victors of historical horrors. But today, we're using the tradition of oral storytelling to begin unpacking the truth. To help us do that work, we're sitting down with Raven Mijah Williams, a direct descendant of a man who lived through the rise and destruction of Tulsa's Greenwood District, also known as Black Wall Street. Raven is the great-granddaughter of A.J. Smitherman, Smitherman was a political visionary, civil rights activist, and a co-founder of Black Wall Street. And that's just a taste of the many contributions he made in his lifetime. Raven is a storyteller, a businesswoman, and a digital age entrepreneur who, for almost a decade, has tirelessly researched and shared the legacy of her family and great-grandfather, who you'll hear her fondly call Big Daddy. Ahead of the Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial, Raven's been working with schools nationwide to discuss black journalism, economy, voting, and racial violence, and developing a podcast that explores the hidden history around Smitherman. She'll bring that knowledge and storytelling to our show today as we talk legacy and the generational inheritances of white tyranny. What does black liberation mean to you? Black liberation means freedom, and I think freedom is a right that we have. Uh, It's our divine, God-given right, and it definitely starts with, you know, liberating your mind and opening your mind to healing the trauma that is in the subconscious mind that a lot of us, um, unfortunately, aren't even aware of. So I know that the PTSD and the post-traumatic stress disorder of slavery and everything that's happened since is a topic that people are able to speak about now. But I think that the important thing to realize with all that is that there is the potential to heal that. And that's something I think the people who built Black Wall Street were about forward projection, knowing they had just come from incredibly atrocious circumstances of slavery and using that to channel the potential to be free and use their freedom. AJ was part of one of the very first freeborn generations of Blacks in America, and he and that generation were definitely ready to use that freedom to liberate themselves. And they did internal work through prayer and their own meditation and their own uh, self-development. I mean, these were people who were doing self-help work because they knew that they needed to heal from this trauma in order to move forward. And they did. And there's so much to learn from the leaders of Black Wall Street in Tulsa and Black Wall Streets that were all across the nation. I am interested in the element of trauma that you mentioned. You know, you are a direct descendant. In what ways did the massacre on Black Wall Street, you know, affect people in your family? Well, I will say that, um, you know, growing up, I always had an awareness of the poem that our Big Daddy wrote about the massacre, which in and of itself spoke to a horrendous event that couldn't, I mean, my my father would read it for the family at reunions and he could rarely get through it and actually really never could get through it without tearing up and getting emotional. And um, it's something when you're growing up knowing 
what happened to your own ancestors and having, I had very close relationships to the descendants that survived the massacre. And my great auntie Carol would talk about how uh, she would tease my father saying, you're lucky to even be here because I carried your mom out of the burning house that the uh, mom had come in and um, they were hiding in the basement and think, you know, at, by the grace of God, they didn't know that and find find them. But they came in and lit the house on fire with coal oil and uh, they barely escaped with their lives out of a flaming house when they left. So she you know, she and my uncle Dell would tell us I was very inquisitive and, you know, still am to this day. But I, I definitely always ask them, um, not always because they never wanted to talk about it, but I tried to get as much information about not just that, but what happened to them when they left. Uh, they had to leave the whole state and flee and never got to come back. So that was also part of the trauma that continued. And then generations later, families were split apart because that generational wealth and stability was just completely massacred as well. Can you tell us who was A.J. Smithman and what were his contributions to Black Wall Street? A.J. Smitherman, first and foremost, was a political visionary and just natural born leader. He had a law degree and had gone to LaSalle University and Northwestern University and come back to Muskogee, Oklahoma. And I say come back because he wasn't raised in Muskogee particularly, but that's where he came back because he had been raised near there and Muskogee was a very powerful town, even more so than the black part of Tulsa known as Greenwood, but it was Greenwood was up and coming for sure. But he came to Muskogee and the first thing he accomplished was doing an expose of the guardianship racket, which was where the oil uh, money was being racketed and white guardians were being appointed to be guardians of children just as soon as the oil struck on their land because this was uh, Indian territory where they were given land and then it would strike oil. And as soon as it did, um, they would dispossess the freedmen and the Native Americans who owned oil land there. So he exposed that. Then he realized that there was this grandfather clause that was making it very hard for Blacks to vote and that both Republicans and Democrats were voting for the grandfather clause, which didn't make sense to him because Republicans would always get the Black vote and they were still voting to make it harder for Blacks to vote. So he started to realize that until Blacks diversified their vote, there really was not going to be the change that Blacks needed because neither Republicans who took the Black vote for granted nor Democrats who thought they'd never get the Black vote would do anything to earn the Black vote. So he decided he was going to start a Black Democratic newspaper, and that's what he did. And he moved to Tulsa from Muskogee in order to do that, and he had the first nationally distributed newspaper, black newspaper. He had the first daily black newspaper in America and he had the first democratic black newspaper. So he was quite a pioneer and visionary. He just kept fighting until blacks diversified their vote and he flipped the vote from Republican to Democratic in Greenwood and Tulsa. That's truly incredible. So can you describe what the responses were to his work from both whites and blacks as related to the things you mentioned, like the, the guardianship exposés and shifting the political action of the black community? Well, he definitely made a lot of enemies, um, but because of his power of the pen, he was really what 
you know, many called a pen warrior with his paper because he owned that paper. He published that paper. He didn't have to answer to um, anyone in the things that he was able to publish. And he was an investigative journalist that would get the story correct. And then as a lawyer, hold every person accountable from, you know, the local deputy to the sheriff, to the commissioner, to the governor, you know, to the mayor, to the governor. I mean, he he at one point got 38 people arrested in Dewey County, including a mayor and a sheriff who had burned down about 19 homes. And he just would hold people's feet to the fire. So the number of things, because he was uh, eventually appointed to be a justice of the peace. And so that made him a judge. And his brother, John Smitherman, who I definitely want to give shots out to, because he was a very brave and wound up being the first elected black sheriff in Tulsa, but a very brave patrolman and deputy. And they both pretty much maintained justice in the Greenwood district and had a lot of influence. So he had influence with multiple governors and mayors because the press had the power then that it does now. And he just was someone who held people to that. And from a very ethical and moral perspective too. And he definitely held, you know, black people in Greenwood to the same standard. He didn't discriminate in terms of anybody who was breaking the law. What type of messages was he putting out in his publications in addition to to what you've mentioned? Well, he was always addressing the achievements of Blacks from Booker T. Washington to W.B. Du Bois and was a very, very much a proponent of Black females and their organizations. And he, he definitely was a herald for all of what was happening nationally in terms of the pride that he took and thought Black should take in their accomplishments that was well-deserved, given that they didn't even have bootstraps, as people say, to pull themselves you know, up from. So that was one thing. But he also was always forcing and warning um, and encouraging Blacks to be on guard for whatever was happening. And then as the lynching problem started to become more and more rampant, he definitely um, was using his newspaper to warn Blacks to be ready to defend themselves and to not allow mob rule because if you just accepted lynchings, what's going to stop them from continuing to intimidate and terrorize your families? And that is exactly what happened with the Tulsa massacre. And he was very prophetic in seeing it coming. What were folks' response to that early on? Because, you know, he was, as you mentioned, prophetic in that regard. Was the community open to receiving that type of information in terms of self-defense and the prediction that it would turn into mob rule uh, even more so than it already was? Well, I think, you know, anyone who might be predicting a Holocaust, and we've seen this in different Holocausts throughout the world at different in different times and different parts of the world. Um, if you're someone that sees it coming, then it takes a while for people to buy into the potential that it could actually affect you. And that's definitely something that was the case here. However, as more and more lynchings were happening, as more and more towns were being burned down, it definitely became something where many more people started to prepare for. Um, So I think that it's, unfortunately, you know, this is something that went on over time and it just grew. And Tuskegee Institute was publishing numbers regularly on the annual number of lynchings and where they were occurring. and, um, And this started with Ida B. Wells, Uh, another person that deserves her shot out because she definitely was the pioneer 
a woman that started recording the lynchings, you know, one of the very first people, if not the first person to start recording these and publishing the, the number of lynchings happening. So it just became overwhelmingly possible that this is something that could happen. And then it did. Are you aware of a, a timeline from when he first started reporting and warning of this to when that fateful day actually occurred? He was not only warning of it, that it would happen in Greenwood. He was getting asked by the white leadership in Oklahoma to stop lynchings through his own actions. And he did so. He would show up to stop it. And he's, you know, there are stories about that, um, about those very things and detail. And that's why Dick Rowland is, you know, it's one of the reasons he's alive today, because these brave men answered the call. And the call was, don't wait till after someone's been lynched to react. But yes, he definitely was at the forefront of reporting these things. And the bravery of these men is just something that is not something to take for granted in terms of what we can learn today. Because even though they lost that fight, we're talking about it 100 years later. And hopefully we'll learn from it 100 years later so that it's not in vain. So when he would show up to these lynchings that were either in progress or about to occur, was he armed in terms of weaponry or was he armed with his tools of the press? Well, both. He was always armed physically and he was always armed with everyone's awareness of what he was willing to put in his paper, which were names and addresses. He did not hesitate to call you out in the largest print he needed. So there was that. However, it's almost like he had angelic forces protecting him because I don't know how he survived. Otherwise, everything he did from standing up to gangsters while he was cleaning up Tulsa when he first got there and he saw how corrupt it was and decided that his family was not going to live in this corrupt neighborhood. So he cleaned it up from prostitute houses and casinos and it was very corrupt. And so he held all of the officials accountable and most of those people were white, but he just kept printing their name in that paper and threatening to make it go national. And so they would close down these establishments and drive out these gangsters. So he just uh, had a reputation of holding people accountable. So from my understanding, he was falsely accused of inciting a riot based off what he was publishing in terms of warning black folks to prepare for something like this. Is my understanding correct? And can you tell the story about how that went down? Yes. Um, he actually had a grand jury indict him and the newspaper, the Tulsa Star, for inciting the riot. And um, they absolutely came for him and our family's house specifically to make sure this powerful presence was no longer going to be this nuisance it had been since you know, 1913 in Tulsa. And this was in 1921. And a lot of it, you know, was around the black vote and the power he had established there in what could happen if you could flip it, which he did. And he's a pioneer in doing that. So, yes, he was indicted for that. They tried to extradite him and have him brought back from Massachusetts where he landed for a period of time and came out of exile on purpose. He was advised to flee to Canada and he refused to do so and instead wanted the world to know about what had happened there. Um, it had been very much concealed and hidden and buried and he just wasn't having it and decided, nope, not only am I not going to flee, I'm going to come out of exile and uh, or at least come out of hiding and I mean, he he died a fugitive. He wasn't exonerated of that until many years after his death. And thanks to the NAACP and the efforts of a woman named Barbara Goodwin. And it definitely is something that 
people don't understand, you know, he wound up in Buffalo because it was close to the Canadian border, I'm sure. And the North Star, which was always his patron, St. Frederick Douglass, that was out of that area. So he started the Buffalo Star when he landed in Buffalo, and then it became the Empire Star. That's what happened after he had to leave Oklahoma, but he was never able to return. What was his life like as he was technically a a fugitive? Was the family in fear of authorities coming to find them, or were they living a relatively normal life? There's no way to call that life normal after, you know, what they lost. Um, So it's almost like, you know, when you're used to one way of life and you've worked to earn it in this respect, not inherit it, and then it goes to nothing. And while being fugitive, there is no going back from that to normal. But what we can say is that they definitely did recover to the degree that they survived, you know, because families were split apart. I mean, he he started the Buffalo Star during the Depression and it was the Depression. So imagine how much better our family would have fared off with the resources he had and all the land and property he owned and the power that he had and not to mention wealth in Tulsa during the Depression versus what they had to deal with having to start from scratch. And that definitely affected our family who was split up, who uh, members had to go be in foster care because there just wasn't enough resources at times or people had to travel to make money and, you know, just it did not fare well. So the resilience of the way our family has continued to educate ourselves and build businesses and continue the entrepreneurial spirit, the activist spirit, the uh, legal spirit. Descendants definitely um, have uh, rebuilt generations later, but it took a hard toll. Absolutely. Yeah. So it wasn't just, hey, okay, y'all, it's time to move. It's like, no, families were uprooted, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, torn apart and in every way conceivable. Absolutely. Can you tell us a story, something that stands out to you that when you were doing the research really has has stuck with you about Smitherman's story and Black Wall Street? One of the things that I know he stood for so much was Black self-sustainability and the economic empowerment, the political empowerment, the need for Blacks to support one another in commerce, and such a proponent for buying Black and would chastise, you know, the readers who spent their money outside of the Black community and would plead in essays for readers to patronize and to consume and use their money in Greenwood and in the Black businesses, specifically saying, you know, even if it means you're sacrificing some of the perks you might get in the white establishments, um, sacrifice, because we need to build up our businesses. And if you have specific feedback give them constructive criticism and say, you know, this is how it's going down, you know, on the other side of the tracks and you need to step up your game. Um, But don't take your money on the other side of the tracks, Um, literally. And in that in Tulsa, that's how it was. There were railroad tracks dividing Greenwood from the white district. So not only was he a proponent for that philosophy, but he worked to make sure there was ability for Blacks to vote in Greenwood by creating the only all-Black election precinct board um, and becoming the first Black president of an election precinct in America. And so the Greenwood district was one of the only places during this period of time that they were thriving that even had 
uh, freedom of franchise and were able to vote. And a humongous part of that is because he created that because he was a black Democrat in a world where blacks were Republican and they ostracized him quite a bit. Once they found out that he was a black Democrat, a lot of blacks turned their back on him. However, that was only until they realized how much cooperation he was getting from the black democratic party there and how they were able to vote. Therefore they were able to create what became black wall street and it never had prospered quite that way before. And when it flipped back to Republican Party rule, a lot of those things were taken away that he had helped build through his relationships with the Democrats there. So at the time that my great grandfather became a voter, it was taken for granted that blacks would vote Republican. And that was because Lincoln had freed the slaves and he was Republican. And um, it at the time that was known as the party that was not the Southern uh, Confederates that were the Democrats. So we're talking about a period of time where the Democratic Party represented the South and that Southern mentality of Confederacy where they wanted slavery pretty much to remain. But what A.J. Smitherman recognized was although this was true, even Republicans were voting for what was called the grandfather clause. So the grandfather clause was making it very hard for blacks to vote because you had to prove that your grandfather voted in a previous election that blacks could not prove. So it was basically just a vote to suppress the black vote. And what he also saw was that in predominantly Democratic counties, some of them were rejecting the grandfather clause. So he was saying, hmm, isn't this interesting? Republicans are voting for the grandfather clause. Democrats are voting against it. And that's kind of what stemmed his initial curiosity into what this meant. But he definitely took a course of action as a result. So his politics were pretty different than the status quo. What was his relationship like with other prominent black leaders in that area? You could kind of say his relationship is like what the founders of Google would be with the other business people and the investors in that community because he created, he was able through his paper to advertise and give Blacks a place to advertise their businesses and therefore created a whole economy of businesses who now had a way to get to an audience. I mean, you know, when you think of the Madam C.J. Walkers of the world, right, they had to have places to advertise. And because Tulsa was one of the most wealthy places where blacks lived and also because he had a nationally distributed newspaper, advertising in his newspaper was, um, you know, lucrative, at, you know, and that's why I say uh, like into a Google economy. So. J.B. Stratford, O.W. Gurley, these were clients of the Tulsa Star's advertising department. So they all worked together and were comrades in the fight, even though they didn't always agree on everything. They definitely didn't agree on politics, especially at the beginning. They all had a respect for one another that I think could definitely be learned from in this cancel culture that we have today with all the attitude that is, if you don't agree with me on one thing, then go do something with yourself. That's, you know, just not a winning strategy. I know that they all would agree that that's not how they got it done, for sure. What would you say was the tipping point, you know, your great grandfather had been talking about the high possibility of very extreme violence. He'd been writing about that for a while. He'd been involved in shifting political and business environments in that area. So do you have any information on what was that final thing that the whites were like, hey, this is enough is enough. We're just going to get rid of them all. The tipping point for all of these things was the growing power of blacks. So 
You know, that's one of the things, the myths that bothers me the most is, you know, Blacks never pulled themselves out. And then especially with the comparison of like other immigrant groups, as if that's what Black Americans have ever been, unless they have a background as immigrants. So not only were we not given boots, we pulled ourselves out anyway. Blacks were building on their own and against every obstacle and with every challenge imaginable and still did it. And then it got destroyed in so many places across the country. And Black Wall Street uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, is one of many Black Wall Streets, you know, that would represent that area of the country. And so the tipping point became this movement of making sure that the black power that was being established, because one way to get rid of a black vote and the prospect of a black growing voting population was just to burn the town down, to just drive them all out. Um, And this continues to happen in different ways to this day. And that is something that uh, people need to pay attention to as a strategy to just, you know, completely get rid of a population of votes. So that is something people don't realize. A lot of people put it on jealousy and racism and not that those things aren't at play, but there was a reason why those towns were able to thrive until the grandfather clause got turned down by the Supreme Court after being in effect for five years. And during that period of time that it was, you know, being able to be exercised in these states that were making it hard for Blacks to vote or impossible. Um, And again, Tulsa, Greenwood, that whole district was exempt from this thanks to the all Black precinct board that they had um, due to A.J. Smitherman's efforts. But Literally every other place in the Midwest and the South practically just could not vote. They did not have freedom franchise for that five-year period of time, at least. And so during that time, you know, it, they their vote wasn't a threat. But once it became overruled and it became a threat, there was another way to handle it, and it was to smoke them out. What are some of the key lessons you think our community could learn from the work and the legacy of A.J. Smitherman so we can continue building in ways that he built for our community? Well, for one thing, I would say he would still be encouraging people. And now that there's the ability to do so using the Internet, um, he would still be encouraging Black people to keep the dollar in the Black community and to make sure that they understood the importance of that economic empowerment to buy property, to invest in the things of the day that made sense. But also, he was a very big proponent of helping people who were coming right off the sharecropping fields and, you know, reach back and help assist your brother who's coming up, who hasn't reached your level of success yet. Um, And this is still the largest massacre, you know, race massacre since the Civil War uh, in terms of damage done to this day. So when you think about the potential, it's something that should impress upon people how wise it would be to uh, invest in the communities in ways that make sense. It's very inspiring the way he and others uh, worked to sustain what they needed. And he would also say, even if you're going to have a falling out with the business owner over something personal, don't fall out with the business. You know, (laughs) keep your money there anyway, because Obviously, they weren't always seeing eye to eye then any more than they will now. Um, And the infighting existed, as they say. But he was encouraging people 100 years ago 
Don't let that move your money. And I think that that's an attitude that needs to resurrect itself. And I just think that there's a potential to take it back to the day where they would keep their money circulating in the Black community. And that's what I think is a wise move for, you know, all people is to invest in our people in our community. And that's what definitely AJ was such a big proponent of. Raven, I really appreciate your time today sharing the story of AJ Smitherman. Although it's obviously not the full story, we appreciate you sharing the bits that you were able to in this time. And where can folks go to check out more of your work on this matter? So they can go to ajsmitherman.com or ravenwilliams.com. Both will lead you to information both about his legacy in Black Wall Street and about what you can do to heal your own trauma as it relates to things that our people have unfortunately had to suffer through. This summer, the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission will be facilitating actions, activities, and events that will commemorate, educate, and help rebuild the Greenwood District of Tulsa. To participate and learn more about the Tulsa Race Massacre and the upcoming events, visit www.tulsa2021.org. That's www.tulsa2021.org. This podcast is produced by Push Black the nation's largest nonprofit black media company. At Push Black, we agree with Marcus Garvey when he said, a people without knowledge of their past, history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. And I'm guessing you probably feel like that's important too. I mean, here you are at the end of a podcast about black history. You matter. Your choice to be here matters. It lets us know that you value this work. Push Black exists because we saw we had to take matters into our own hands. You make Push Black happen with your contributions at blackhistoryyear.com. Most folks do five or 10 bucks a month, but everything makes a difference. Thanks for supporting the work. The Black History Year production team includes Tariq Alani, Patrick Sanders, Albany Jones, William Anderson, Jerea Bradley, Brooke Brown, Shonda Buchanan, Brianna Lambach, Courtney Morgan, Aquia Tay, Tasha Taylor, Leslie Taylor Grover, and Darren Wallace. Producing and editing the podcast, we have Sydney Smith and Ivana Tucker. Julian Walker is the executive producer of the podcast. And I'm Jay from Push Black. Thanks for checking us out. <laughs>